Germplasm is any seed, any woody cutting, any bulb, any corm, whatever propagative material you can use to create a new plant, that's considered germplasm. This is Kim Hummer, who's the director of the U.S. Clonal Germplasm Repository in Corvallis. She's an amazing woman who has traveled around the world on expeditions collecting wild plants. And she recently named a new species of wild strawberry from strawberries that she found practically in her own backyard in Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest. But she's been all over. She's been collecting blueberry relatives in northern Vietnam and all kinds of amazing things around the world. This is in the tissue culture lab. This is a strawberry. This is how a lot of these plants are preserved. Those might be the only strawberries of that variety in the world, living in this little gel suspension in a refrigerator in Corvallis. And all of these things are available for us. As long as you have a legitimate research, education, or breeding purpose, it's their responsibility to send you seeds or cuttings or so you can't in vitro just be a tubers. A little farm or a little garden. You can be, as long as you convince them that you're doing breeding work. They don't want to send stuff that's just going to languish in a garden and disappear. They want it to go somewhere that's going to be used for research or for breeding. She's got hops. This repository maintains the hops collection. Hazelnuts. They have 798 hazelnut accessions in their collection. They have 1,921 strawberries, 2,308 pears, 586 mints. They've got 2,145 rubus, which is blackberries, raspberries, 1,763 vacciniums, which is the blueberry genus. And um, I mean, they have 133 quinces, 626 hops varieties. So it's, again, incredible diversity. But this germplasm station is painfully understaffed. They've had budget cuts every year. It's just a real tragedy. The Trump administration is planning to cut funding further. They have earmarked 20 locations or something to close down the one that maintains the coffee and the cacao. They want to shut it down. Makes my blood boil. This is a guy named Jason in the DNA lab there where they're doing DNA fingerprinting and mapping and they're doing amazing work there. That's Kim again, the director, Dr. Hummer. That's Dusty, my uh, experimental farm network partner and another guy who works at the germplasm repository. Her name is Jill, and she's the curator of the rubus and ribes, which is ribes is gooseberries and currants, and rubus is, again, raspberries, blackberries, and they have thousands of these. And a lot of this is tropical stuff that may have important genes for our temperate populations. This is a blueberry relative, and there are some from tropical areas that have proven really critical to creating low chill blueberries. So the only reason why you can get blueberries grown in California in the middle of the winter is because of the germplasm that's preserved at this station. This is what it looks like in the database often. That's a wild raspberry relative from China. The government website is run by the Agricultural Research Service. It's called GRIN, Germplasm Resources Information Network. This website is how anybody can access all of this stuff. When they close these places with all this invaluable stuff, where is it going to go? Is it going to just be destroyed? Is it going to die? Is it go to other stations? How bad is it? I don't even know. Um, chances are this stuff is not going to be closed. Trump's last budget, they also proposed cutting a lot from this part of the government, and uh, it didn't happen. ARS hyphen G-R-I-N dot gov. Agricultural Research Service, Germplasm Resources Information Network. They have plant germplasm, animal germplasm, microbial, and invertebrate. I've only taken advantage of the plant germplasm, so I can't speak about the others. I think they may charge for some of them.
and some of the tropical plant germplasm they charge for as well. So you type in here, I typed New Brunswick, New Jersey. There were seven results. I clicked on a grass. Poa pretensis, that's the Latin name. Brunswick is the variety. You can see it's a life form is a perennial. Improvement status is cultivar. It could say land race there, it could say wild. Uh, could say breeding material, form received seed. So the USDA got this as seed in 1996. The name is Brunswick. You scroll down the page a little bit. Somebody patented this in 1972. It's got a plant patent on it. In the narrative here, it says high degree of apomictic reproduction, leafy turf type, medium green color, medium texture, and moderately slow rate of vertical growth. Exceptionally aggressive, attractive, uniform, relatively weed-free, persistent. Excellent resistance to stripe smut disease. Moderately good resistance to leaf spot and crown rot. Moderately susceptible to powdery mildew and leaf rust. Adapted to most regions where Kentucky bluegrass is suited. Um, so that's the species. The source history you can see was donated in 1977. It was developed pre-1997 in Oregon. And then the pedigree is selected from an old lawn on the Cook College campus in New Brunswick, New Jersey, spring 1963. Taken to Oregon, selected there. Oregon is where the big grass seed industry is located. And then was donated back to Rutgers and they donated it to the USDA because they thought it was something worth preserving. The government agrees and now this lives in the seed bank and any grass breeder can take advantage of that. And there are hundreds of thousands of these entries in the database. This is when you click on the species, like I mentioned earlier, it tells you all the common names here in many different languages, other subspecies and how many accessions the government has. They have 821 Poa pretensis accessions in the USDA germplasm system. Just this species, Kentucky bluegrass, 821. That's also called English meadow grass in England. We call it Kentucky bluegrass, smooth meadow grass. Then they tell you places where it's native, the economic importance, it's used for erosion control, lawn turf, soil improver, it's animal food, fodder and forage, and it's a potential seed contaminant as a weed. And then it also shows you places where it's naturalized, many places around the world. You can find more about it in all these references. Wow. This one happened to have a picture of the seeds as well, or florets. I clicked on this pear as well, called Mac. Pears are really interesting, and they have a ton of different pears. You know, you can see the ploidy sometimes. These observations often tell you a lot about the specific variety. Sometimes they've been tested for a lot of things. Sometimes they haven't been tested at all. When you click on detailed accession observation page, it has all of this information, but much more easily organized. And then the cool thing about this is you can see how it compares to other ones. So this one had no damage from rust. If you click on the word rust, it'll take you to a list where it has all of the different pairs or it tells you how many pairs have number one for no damage, number two for moderate damage, number three for lots of damage, whatever it is. Um, we have a problem with fire blight. Yeah. Is that one of those things that I'm not recognizing? They may not have tested this for fire blight or it may have a different name. I'm not up on what that is. Pseudomonas might be something. But you can find things that are resistant to fire blight or to other things in here, I'm sure. This has a low yield, so it's probably not all that important, but buttery texture, quality is mid-range. This one had a lot of different traits written about. And then I uh, went and clicked add to order, and then it ends up in a list like this, a shopping cart, just like you're shopping on Amazon. You can pile up a whole bunch of things, click checkout. They ask you to write basically a paragraph explaining what you're gonna do with it. And you have to make an account with them now. You didn't have to do that, but it's pretty easy to do. And they send it to you for free. I'm real into sorghum, as I mentioned. This sorghum is called Nerum boer. Can't see a good picture of it here, but it's one from South Sudan. 
lot of information there. This is the sucrose and bricks counts from a couple of different studies of the various sorghums in the collection. This one has a 9.57 sucrose count. Then I click on sucrose and it takes me to this next page. All of the sorghums that they've tested for sucrose, 1,212 when you add wow. these two together. And then this is the distribution of values. That one that was nine and change is at the high end. That's a particularly sweet stalked sorghum. The bulk of them here, 258, are in the lower range. Probably not very useful for syrup. These top four, you click on that, and then it shows you what the top four are. And those are probably ones that I want to try. Add it to the cart, and it's in there. Lots of information about where this one came from. You also find the legal aspect. If it's patented, it says it right there. A lot of them have a plant variety protection, PVP, on them which is like a patent, but it expires in 20 years. So, you know, when you see the date, you can know if it's expired or not. And, uh, Are these finite bottles of seeds, or is somebody actually growing and maintaining them? They grow and maintain them every, every so often, Where? like every 10 years, all around the country. There's, I think, 22, 25 different germplasm sites. The sorghum is maintained mostly in Ames, Iowa. The apples and pears are mostly up in Geneva, New York. Pullman, Washington has the chickpeas and the fava beans. Parlier, California has got the jojoba. Mayaguez, Puerto Rico has a whole bunch of tropical stuff. I think Hilo, Hawaii has some stuff. There's a Palmer, Alaska station. They're all over. Beltsville, Maryland is a big one regionally. And Griffin, Georgia is the big one in the southeast. Miami as well. That's been one of the most important resources that we've had for doing all of this work, finding useful wild plants. And this shows you the native range for the Maypop. And if you zoom in on that map, it'll show you county level where it lives. So this is where our farm is, just outside of Cumberland County. And we were able to find basically the northernmost wild population of Maypops to save those seeds because we want the stuff from the extremes. If it can handle a New Jersey winter and stay perennial, that's the one we want to keep propagating. This is a really interesting plant called Melothria pendula. You may have seen mouse melons or um, cuca melons, they call them sometimes, sour gherkin. These are extra tiny. The annual ones are about two or three times the size, but this is actually a perennial species. It's also called Guadalupe cucumber, or creeping cucumber. It's a vining perennial plant, and it's native to the Caribbean and to the southeast. I'm sure it grows around here. But the farthest north population until recently was in Virginia or something, or um, maybe in North Carolina. And then 2006 or so, somebody did this study, floristic discoveries in Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. These people from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and New York Botanical Garden and some unaffiliated individuals. It was 2011, actually. And they found a population of Melothria pendula in Delaware, which is way farther what north. They taste, like? they taste like a little cucumber. Ooh. They're tasty. So my friend, actually Chris, with the kale, found this. He was interested in that species and he said, hey, there's one growing in Delaware. Maybe you can go find it. So I found this study and I, you know, I read, okay, collections cited below represent an addition to the flora of Delaware and the first report of this species from the eastern shore of Maryland. Both populations of this species are presumably non-native. The Delaware population is located along the base of a mill pond and the Maryland population is located in a heavily urbanized area of Ocean City growing along a fence. Wow. Currently, Melothria pendula is extant to the south in Accomack and Northampton counties, Virginia, and it is apparently expanding its range northward. In North America, this species ranges from Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, west to Indiana, south to Florida and Texas. So I'm sure it's around here. Voucher specimens, Delaware, Sussex County, southwest of the town of Seaford at Craig's Mill Pond at intersection of Figs Road and Craig's Mill Pond <laughs> along the edge of a wooded swamp at the base of a dam. Did so, you go there? Of course I went there. <laughs> and, uh, and there it is. There it, is. <laughs> it was hard to find. It took a while. 
I was about to give up and then like creeping behind some grapevines, I noticed a vine that looked a little different and then I saw the telltale jelly bean sized cucumbers. So, cute. so you know, again, that's, that's an interesting population. I don't even remember what the flowers look like. They're very inconspicuous. Um, and I was given some from a guy who grows them up in Massachusetts that he probably collected further south and started a population. They have slightly bigger fruit and they creep along the ground. They don't seem to want to climb. Um, but I grew some of that last year too. So we're, we're helping to spread them further north, but it's an, an, an inevitability at this point. You know, with the climate changing, yeah. all these things are creeping up slowly but surely. This is that sea kale, except rather than being in Northern Europe, this is in Oregon at the base of a cliff just above where the waves are breaking along the Pacific coast, a place called Yakina Head, where there's an old lighthouse. And probably 150 years ago, there was a kitchen garden at that lighthouse and they grew sea kale and it naturalized just at the base of this cliff. Wow. So again, there's interesting genes in there. It's not a native plant, so we were able to collect a bit and grow some. So I have some of that growing back in my house. The uh, chinkapin chestnut, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the last segment. On the left is what a typical wild chinkapin looks like. And this one on the right is clearly much bigger. This one came from a farm in Virginia, Tidewater, Virginia, uh, by the Chesapeake Bay. There was a patent lawyer named Osville Jackson who was fascinated by chinkapins and spent 40 years breeding them and growing them. And uh, the house, the property was up for sale. I got a message from somebody I met online who knew that I was interested in these plants and said, hey, there's a, there's a population and the property's up for sale and we don't know what's gonna happen with it. So I called the realtor up and said, I'd like to come take a look at this property and wanna go take a look at these nuts and managed to get a few in my pocket. Went just at the right time, but property hasn't sold. We're, they're asking too much for it, I think but there's really amazing things growing at this property. And that's the kind of thing, if nobody's looking for it, nobody knows about it, it can easily get lost. We need to get somebody else in there like Nature Conservancy. <laughs> it, actually is a, it actually owns a large mill pond as well. Uh -huh. It's like a small mm. few acres and then like a 26 acre mill pond. Okay. And they own up to two feet above the shore around it. So all the other properties around the mill pond are not even allowed to fish on it because it's owned by somebody else. It's a cool property. I'll be going back there at some point, and if I ever make a lot of money, I'll probably buy it. It owns a whole pond. I think it may be 40 acres more or less, um, or something like 26. Maybe it's even less than that. But it's a really interesting, really interesting location. Um, but uh, the last place I'm going to talk about is uh, this is actually the Nanticoke River. So Nanticoke people. Obviously, they're the same people as that squash. This is in southern Delaware. By some coincidence, it is about five or ten minutes from the location of that Melothria pendula little cucumber near the town of Seaford. So I got interested in chinkapins and I started looking for things online about them. And I found this couple in southern Delaware who the husband was a, an archaeologist, used to work for the state of Delaware. And um, they started writing essays about Native American agroecology, basically. The kinds of systems that people set up um, across, their, across the region, but especially in Delaware. And he was particularly interested in their plant communities and the relationships to plants. So the property where he grew up happens to be on the edge of what was the main Nanticoke settlement in that area uh, in the 1600s when John Smith first encountered the Nanticoke people. Um, the town there was called Kaskarawak, and uh, there's, still a little, there's still a little community there called Indian Village that's mostly white people living there, and, uh, but it's, that's the location of the original settlement, and this is on the edge of it. The Nanticoke River here flows down into the Chesapeake Bay, but this place, I think it's 17 miles from where it empties into the bay, is the last place where it's fordable on foot, basically. 
not surprising that that became an important location because people could walk across the river there. Glenn found on this side of the river American chestnut trees that had been planted in a line. Um, and they were, um, American chestnuts are very susceptible to the blight. So they die back, they'll grow maybe 30 feet. And just as they're about to reach uh, maturity and start producing seeds, they'll die back to the ground. But the roots generally stay alive for a long time and they keep coming back. So he was able to find these chestnut trees and realize that they were planted in a line along the, uh, along the riverbank. He also found a plant called box huckleberry growing there that is native to the Appalachians, but it's, it's a creeping ground cover like a blueberry. Scientists believe that it stopped sexually reproducing in the Pleistocene 14,000 years ago, presumably because all of the male plants died during the Ice Age. Whoa. So there are a few female plants left, but they don't have any pollen. So they only reproduce vegetatively. They creep maybe six inches a year. So it's possible to date the population based on how big it is, ba date the planting. Most of them grow in North Carolina, in Tennessee, in Pennsylvania, West Virginia. Um, and there's no boys anywhere. As far as anybody knows, there's no boys anywhere. So nobody's, nobody's, fa nobody's, had, nobody's had a viable seed for a while. No sex. The, um, the berries apparently don't taste like much, but they were apparently useful and uh, you know, maybe ceremonially valuable or important because this plant made its way to southern Delaware from somewhere really far away. And in the past two years, somebody's been doing DNA tests on all this, and they found that this plant, the one that's growing on the coastal plain in southern Delaware, is the same plant as one in Kentucky. Oh, wow. So sometime, and they, based on the size of the patch uh, in Delaware, it's about 1,600 years old. So some 1,600 years ago, somebody brought that plant from Kentucky to Delaware. Why not the other way around? It's not indigenous to the wow. coastal plain. It's a mountain plant. It's really crazy that it, that, that happened. Um, They've also dated pottery to 1,600 years ago in that site. So that's when they believe that settlement really began or came into its heyday. To me, anyway, the most interesting thing are the chinkapins. This is a chinkapin tree. That's dusty. We were harvesting a bunch of them. About seven, eight years ago, they had a forester come take a look at the property, and they saw these scrubby little bushes. The guy said, hey, those are chestnuts. And Glenn said, no, that's not a chestnut. I know what a chestnut is. We have them across the river. He said, no, those are chinkapin chestnuts. And if you cut out the canopy, they'll probably grow back. And so he started cutting down the big pine trees there and opening up the canopy. And sure enough, the chinkapins started growing. And they got, some of them got 10, 15 feet tall, and they started producing a whole bunch of seeds. And they were planted not quite regular, but in very obviously a large patch. And some of, the, some of the plants are coming from root bases that were this big, which means that that was a tree that could have been 500 years old when, wow. the, when the blight felled it, but the roots stayed alive. And so now it's a big clump coming up from that same root ball. And those may have been planted, I mean, that may have been a Nanticoke food forest planted as much as 1,600 years ago and still exists, is still producing food. We've gotten a lot of seeds from there. More recently, Glenn found in the adjacent Nature Conservancy land, maypops growing as well, which is another plant that northern part of the range, chances are these were brought by somebody and planted there. And now they grow wild. They've got big, nice big fruit and uh, really delicious. That's the kind of plant exploration that, uh, that I've been doing practically in my own backyard. And that kind of thing can be done everywhere. I'm sure there's interesting places like that all around this area as well. And uh, that's the end of the second talk. So Whoa. thank you.